Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So I see so many friends face, uh, faces and uh, it's uh, really quite amazing. And I wish I could just talk with each of you individually, but uh, um, I'm going to talk today about collecting photographs of India. And there's some of you there in the audience who know even more, much more about it than I do. But uh, I'm going to tell you about my adventures and how I learned about doing it. Um, when I came to the CMA in 2011, um, it has, of course, one of the great collections of, of Indian art, Southeast Asian Indian art in the United States, but it didn't have very many photographs. It had actually 15 uh, 19th century photographs of 19th century of India and Southeast Asia, but they were very high quality ones. And I just give you an example here of an early one, uh, fairly early by Colonel Thomas Biggs. Uh, just beautiful romantic photos. And a woman who's really one of the major curators and collectors of Indian painting and also photography in the US, Catherine Lynn Bankheim, who you see on the right here, and she's with her, um, her wife, Barbara Timmer, in this photo. They came to the museum uh, working on a project with um, Sonia Mace, our curator of Indian photography, Indian art. And um, Catherine wanted to see all of our Indian photos. So all 15 of them, we brought them out into the art study room. And she said, wow, this is really wonderful uh, what you've got, but it's pretty small. And I said, well, I really would like to expand that collection. It's not an area I know a lot about. Um, and I had actually studied my third, we had to have a major, a minor, and a minor minor in graduate school during the PhD. And my minor minor was Indian art, not photography, but sculpture painting, but I've, you know, forgotten most of that. I've probably forgotten um, more than I actually knew. And so I was starting as a kind of a neophyte. And um, Barbara actually, uh, Kathy said, well, look, um, this is a field in which you can still afford to make mistakes. You can still get things cheaply. Um, you can even get things on eBay. And I said, yeah, I've been prowling, but I didn't quite know what to buy. And she said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna give you a $5,000 you're gonna go out and you're gonna spend it. And if you make mistakes, that's okay. You can just, and you know, you, you'll buy photos for the museum and, um, and you'll see, and you'll start learning the field, which was an amazing vote of confidence. So of course I immediately went to eBay. And the first photo that I bought was this um, Ceylonese photo, so photo of a Ceylonese gentleman. Um, and as you can see, it wasn't terribly expensive. Um, and one of the things that I was very leery about when I was buying photos was, um, how do you know if it really is as good as the scan? And um, one of the things that I have found is that there are certain dealers that I have found to be reliable. Once or twice, I've actually had to return things because they weren't as good looking as the scan or there were condition issues. But um, that's one of the important things. So don't just think that you're gonna to go to eBay and buy anything um, and it's gonna come and it's gonna be great. So there's always a risk. It's kind of a, an exciting, thrilling thing to do. And here's what the photo looks like in real life. Um, maybe not as dark and rich as it could have been, but it's a fun photo to add to the collection. And most of the things that we had were not people, they were landscapes. And um, so I started off and I, I also found one more thing on eBay that I couldn't resist. And that was the Skeen and Company photograph of a Buddhist temple in Candy, Ceylon. And one of my goals in buying photographs is that they be seen. I don't want to just buy them and put them in a drawer in the museum, no matter what their topic. And so I wanted to buy works that my colleague, Sonia Mace, would find relevant to her collections that were on view. So she put them up in her galleries, which she's really excited to do and happy to do. And so architecture was one of those um, subjects that can often uh, relate to things that she has in the collection. And so this photograph is so cheap that I couldn't actually use Barbara's, uh, Kathy's money for it, Kathy and Barbara's money for it. Um, I just felt for $75, I had to pay for it myself and buy it in their honor, which is what I did. However, I think I was ready for bigger adventures. And one of those secret fairs, I'm going to tell you about the secret fair that Evan was talking about. Um, every year, pretty much, except for the last couple of years, I've gone to uh, Paris for Perry Photo. It's one of the more onerous duties of my job. I have to go spend a week in Paris every year. And uh, we go for Perry Photo, the big fancy fair in the Grand Palais. But there is what I call a photo flea market on, used to be on Sunday, sometimes now it's on Saturday. 
And the first time I went, it was held in the building that you see on the left, the Gallery Vivienne which is this amazingly wonderful space. It was built in 1823 and it's these open arcades and they're closed off by the roofs, but they're, they're really not like being indoors. They're sort of half indoors, half outdoors. And it wasn't quite as orderly as you see it here. There were people uh, with uh, tables with photographs set up all around the corridors. And on the right, you see a later iteration of the fair, just to give you an idea that this is not going into the gallery and you see the works beautifully arrayed on the walls. This is big stacks of photographs, very crowded. Everybody's trying to get at them and you kind of have to, it's uh, each man for themselves. And so you kind of have to be a little bit aggressive and you have to look at millions of things. And um, so I was going to this fair and I told Kathy that I was doing that. She said, well, I'm going to give you something else. I'm going to send a guardian angel for you. And that's her friend, good friend, Raphael de Dogadabush, who happens to be the head of the Asian Art Museum in Berlin. And he was coming to Paris for the big fair as well. And he um, met up with us at the Gallery Vivienne. I was with my husband. These fairs are cash and carry. And it's European cash. You have to have euros. Some of the dealers even want pounds. So here I am carrying like $5,000, $4,800. And so my husband was the money bearer. And he also, uh, we bought a big portfolio that fit. He, he has a very big suitcase, he thinks. And the portfolio had a piece of mace in it, it fit in the suitcase. So I had my way to get the photos back on, you know, in decent shape. And I had my Sherpa, I had my husband as the bearer. And so, um, and I had Raphael to advise me. And I, I think it would be remiss if I didn't mention two other people who have been great uh, people to consult with and who've really helped me learn a lot about Indian photo. And that's Sonia Mace on the top, our curator of um, Indian and Southeast Asian art, and Essa, Essa Epstein, who is actually here with us tonight, I saw. So that's pretty exciting. So Raphael and I met up, it was rainy, it was cold, even inside the Gallery Vivienne. And we walked through all these booths, and this is again a later iteration of the fair. I didn't, couldn't find any photos of the Gallery Vivienne, but I got there before Raphael did. And so, and I didn't really know what he looked like. So maybe he was there and I didn't quite see him at first. So I went around to all these dealers saying, do you have an Indian photos? Do you have an Indian photos? Do you have an Indian photos? And people either said no, or what they showed me was dreck, just like bleh. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm gonna be spending my money this year, whoa. And then I met up with Raphael and we went back to some of those same dealers. But lo and behold, when Raphael asked them, they had been pulled out something from behind the table, which was the good stuff that they had been saving, knowing that collectors like him and other people, even maybe Kathy, although she wasn't in town that year, might be, might be coming. And so there was some really great stuff. And these are the seven works that I ended up buying. Um, and they were really nice and lovely additions to our collection. Some of them are by unidentified photographers. Um, maybe someday I'll stumble across that image and be able to put a name to it. Um, there are a couple of Ceylonese images, um, you know, a French photographer and the Friths. And actually I had spent almost all of the money when we discovered the Friths. And I really wanted them, but they were gonna take me over the total of $5,000. And so I made my husband give me some of his money and he always claims I didn't pay him back. I swear I did, but, um, and so I was able to get both frisks as well and add them. So put them in the, in the, in the um, portfolio that we brought. And when we went back to the hotel, we put them away and then took them back on the plane. And of course, showing up with art is not the way you're supposed to do it at a museum. You're supposed to arrange for it to be shipped. You're supposed to notify the registrar. It's supposed to be properly packed. I just called Monday morning right before I came in and said, I need a registrar, I've got some art. And they were like, what, what? And so um, it was quite an adventure because they're always, they think I'm a little bit crazy um, doing this, but, and especially shipping them back in luggage because they don't fit in the cabin, the portfolio. So, uh, but I shipped them back through, um, just in our luggage, they arrived. I didn't lie about them in customs. You don't have to pay um, duty on art and nobody really cares about photos anyway is what I find. And so I was able to bring them back and start adding to the collection. Well, that was the end of my money from Catherine. I had spent it all and I, she seemed to feel that I had spent it very wisely and so did Sonia. 
Uh, <clears throat> but I had started to plan about what else I really wanted to add. Who did I need to add? What sort of things was I looking for? And one of the things I was looking for was I really wanted to get work by a 19th century work by Indian photographers. And I targeted as my first Rajadin Dayal. <clears throat> and I started asking dealers and writing people. And I saw a few things, but they weren't in great shape. They weren't very interesting. Um, and mostly they had condition issues. And a lot of this work, you know, it's been around the block. It's, it's not necessarily that easy to find. And you would think, oh, maybe I could just use my travel money and go to India and sweep around the flea markets and pick it all up. Well, most of it actually came back to, it was made a lot of it for the British and the tourist trade. And a lot of it came back to England. So a lot of it is really in England and, and London is sort of a locus for it. Every year in um, London, they have drawings week and our director and our chief curator are both drawings curators. So they go to that religiously. Well, they were there and they went to one of these dealers um, that had some drawings they were looking at. And he primarily has Indian art, I will not name him. And, um, and the chief curator noticed that there were some Dean Dial photos and the name had stuck when I talked to her about it. And so she um, had him send me images and uh, Raja Dean Dial was the first um, Indian photographer to really become well established. He was trained by the British in surveying and moved over from that into photography. And in fact, um, he started doing photography. A lot of his, he's best known for his landscapes and his buildings. And he actually took a two year leave of absence as a surveyor to start photographing around India and see if he could make a, a living of it. And the work that this dealer had was an album that um, was an early album by Dean Dial. And it was assembled in um, probably 1887 or early 1888, which is the period that he was really starting to try to be a professional photographer from images that were shot between 1885 and the summer of 1887. So this was very exciting because it's a very early album. There were 37 album in prints and I was sort of hoping and expecting that this bound album would arrive at the museum. He sent me images of every, of pictures, they look great. Well, it, these unmounted prints arrived at the museum, which was interesting. Um, and the images are a wide range, there's 37 of them. Uh, they include a number of uh, military scenes like this of different groupings of people and regiments. This is the Bhopal Italian and indoor, and I just love the patterning um, uh, of the turbans and how what a wonderful sense of pattern and rhythm he has. He's really a wonderful photographer. Um, and there are also portraits of the Maharajas, especially the boy Maharajas in this album. And so I just love this one where, you know, you can, you can uh, put the kid in a Maharaja outfit and give him you know, all the jewels, but he's still gonna sit there like a, a kid and sort of toe his feet in and play around. I mean, it's just a wonderful image of human nature. And then some of the uh, scholarly apparatus that show you that he is getting Western book learning. Uh, he has a clock, he's aware. But also what I think is marvelous is that um, just the expression. I mean, he really, um, Dial was really able to capture, you know, the attention of these sitters and really get them to, um, uh, sort of really focused so that you feel like you're looking at them. Whoop, that's supposed to happen. Um, and one of the things I did mention is condition. You can't expect a lot of this work to be in perfect condition, but you try to get as, as good a condition as you can. And so it's always a sort of trade-off between the image and the condition. Um, there was a few images of um, elephant batteries and rehearsals of uh, military um, procedures. There's the elephant in the back. And whoops, images are of the Maharajas and some of their advisors, but also of the colonial elite. And so we have the, the his eminence commander in chief and party. And Simla was the summer mountain retreat for the uh, British government, the colonial government. And so Dean Dial went there and spent um, you know quite a bit of time there and photographed people. So you have this marvelous formal setting and what I adore, I mean, you have the dog laid out and then you have the tiger skin and you have the man who perhaps maybe even hunted the tiger. He's got his foot firm, firmly planted on that tiger skin. Um, 
and you know the woman looking and it's really a great arrangement and they're on their veranda with the plants um it's really you know she's got this amazing hat with all the feathers <clears throat> these two people are sort of supposedly talking to each other or looking at one another um it's really a marvelous arrangement of people both formally and in terms of expressions and relations um and he just excelled at that and also we have the colonials at leisure and there's some pictures of a picnic party. I love the swing from the platform so you can really go high. There's a cost child's costume party, uh, people dressed up for a fancy theatrical that they're acting out at a party. So we see the British elite with their hair up and their hair down, so to speak. However, one of the problems was that, as I said, these unmounted photos came and I said, wait a minute, where's the album? I thought this was an album. Well, um, it turns out that he sent the album to a conservator and had her take the sheets all off, the photos off, and didn't, um, you know, document any of it, didn't document what went with what. He did take some caption information off, but he didn't take all of the information. And so it became a real puzzle to try to figure out which pages went where and what order the album was in, because the authorship of the album is something that remains unresolved. And um, so, for instance, I had a graduate student, Bing, Bing Wang, a PhD student, who spent an entire year working on a, a two semesters, trying to fit which page went where, which image, so that we could put the album back in order and try and determine not only who the people were, but perhaps who the commissioner of the album was, because people would go into Dean Dial's studio and they would request certain numbers of photos that he had already taken. Uh, you know, it, it, in those days, really, one didn't usually um, say, I want you to come and take pictures of this and that. He would document the summer colonials at Simla, he would document the Maharajas, and then you would go in and pick out which ones you wanted to represent your time in India, your memories of India. And so poor Bing spent like a year trying to match these people up so she could figure out who was who and doing research and which page actually had gone with which of these sheets. So it was quite an adventure. It's still not totally resolved. Um, the next big purchase that I made also came from that same dealer. Um, and he assured me that in this case, he did not break up an album, that he got the works individually, but they came as a group. And um, <clears throat> this was about a year later, I guess. He had a group of 38 photos of Lucknow after the siege in India. So this is part of um, the Indian rebellion or mutiny, depending on how you want to term it. Or, um, and it was when the Indian soldiers, many of whom were working for the British, but many of whom weren't, rebelled against Indian colonial power. And some of the people fighting on the colonial side were actually Indians as well. And it was a, a long and sort of drawn out siege at Lucknow. And Beato um, came there about four months after this had happened. So he was not photographing the actual battle because the, the um, city had already been taken back by the British. But as you'll see in a minute, at, at a great cost. I just love, you know, some of the images in this out in this grouping are really wonderful. Um, this is the king's boat in the shape of a fish, which I just adore. And I just wish I could get one for myself. But there were also a lot of ruins and a lot of destruction. This was um, the banquet hall inside the residency. During the siege, it was used as a hospital. As you can see, roofs are gone. There's just a lot of rubble piled up. There's a, a um, person riding a donkey probably through the ruins. Um, it's really quite an amazing scene and it really recalls to my mind uh, Gardner, um, Gardner's post uh, and Barnard's post-Civil War albums. They're images of the destruction because they weren't photographing the battles, they were photographing the aftermath. And there are also wonderful photos of the architecture that did not get destroyed. So this group also contains a lot of interesting information on the different types of architecture and the mix of Indian and uh, colonial architecture. But the photograph that's probably the best known, and I think it just skipped right over, nope, is um, <clears throat> the interior of the Secundra Bagh after the slaughter of 2000 rebels by the 93rd Highlanders and the 4th Punjab Regiment. And this is what really excited me about this 
group of photos because this may be, and you're seeing a detail of it. I thought I had the whole thing. I'm going to go one further and see. Yeah, no, okay, this is the whole thing. Um, it's, uh, it may be the first image, the first photograph that shows corpses in a battle or, or um, <clears throat> the earliest one, or if not, it's one of the earliest ones. Now here, they're of course skeletons, they're not corpses, but it is really an amazing, um, if that's true, it's really an amazing milestone in the depiction of war and uh, something that actually shows you the aftermath, that there is a human cost to it. Now, of course, the colonial um, people back in England who would order this uh, and had relatives and friends who were in the service in, in India might have thought of it as the vanquishing of the mutineers. But anybody who looks at it, I mean, you can't help but think about the fact that these are human skeletons. Now, there's a big controversy um, unresolved about whether um, the bodies were uh, of the rebels were buried and then he dug them up for the purpose of the photo and artfully scattered them around, um, or whether in fact um, they were sort of stored off in a room and they got them back, or whether four weeks later they would still have been laying out here. Would they have been picked clean as skeletons? Would the climate have done it? Would jackals have done it? Um, you know, the veracity of the photo um, is something that remains under study and under debate. And in fact, um, I, uh, I've been looking at a number of graduate students' work, and two PhD students have included this photo in their dissertations, which I'm looking forward to reading. So <clears throat> I thought I would also throw in something that's not so grim. One of the things that, um, as the museum began to really invest in these photos, we began to realize that, you know, I could spend a little bit more money, and those two groups of photos were not inexpensive. Um, so at but one does not expect to see Indian 19th century photos at Perry Photo. And here you see it in the Grand Palais in all its splendor. Well, one day I came around a corner and there was an image that absolutely trapped me. I just thought this is the most wonderful thing. And it wasn't this exact image, but it was something very like it. And in fact, this is a type of image um, that is made over and over again at uh, for devotees of the shrine of Sri Nachi, who's a manifestation of Krishna. And I just absolutely was floored by it. And there were actually two of them on the wall and I liked one better than the other, but I liked both of them. So I said to the dealer, oh, okay, how much, you know, what's, oh, they're both sold, I'm sorry, madam. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, they just went around the corner too. They just, they just were both bought. And I said, what do you mean by two people, a man and a woman, they each bought one and I said, Oh my goodness, that's terrible. Uh, maybe they'd like to change their mind, reconsider. And I turned, you know, he went around the corner, ran down the hall, but he couldn't find them. So <clears throat> he said, well, I'll keep an eye out. And if any more come in the gallery, they don't come in all that often, but I will, um, I will let you know. Uh, and I said, well, who, do you know who bought them? You know, could you tell me who bought them? And he said, well, Catherine Benkheim and Raphael Gadebusch. <laughs> they each bought one. <laughs> I was like, darn, I didn't even know they were here. So we did meet up with each other later and I expressed my envy. Well, this dealer sent me a couple of different options as they came up over. It took about a year and a half or two years. And finally, this one came up, which I really liked. Um, some of the other ones had condition issues. They wanted, it's an Indian dealer. They wanted to have them done locally in the sort of folk tradition if they needed repainting. I went, no, no, no. But these photos are um, called Manorath paintings and they're evidences of worship. And as you can see, there's a photograph of the faces of the two worshipers. Everything else is a painting. And these were done in workshop-like situations where um, you know tourists would come in, you would actually only have a few minutes at the shrine and Krishna was sort of back and I'm gonna back up for a minute. Krishna was back in the, the Krishna sculpture which you adored and, and worshiped at was back in a room kind of removed from you with these symbols around. Um, and you only got to see it for a, a brief amount of time. And then you had to leave and you were only there, you were making a pilgrimage to this site to go and see um, this shrine and visit it. And so the souvenir, this painting with yourself present in the worship scene was a way of, um, of reliving that moment at home because when you actually looked at this photo and you um, took the, the image of Krishna 
and you thought about it, that was an act of devotion as well. And so these were, uh, had a very strong significance. They weren't just your sort of selfie at the shrine kind of painting, but in fact, they were pretty serious objects for devotion. And it's fascinating that the inclusion of the photos is so seamless. And what they do is they actually plane down both the photographic print and the area of the paper around it. So there's hardly a seam. You have to really see it in raking light like this to even be able to begin to see that there's a photo inserted in there, even though it's, you know, you can tell that it's photographic. So I love that mix of painting and photography um, and the way the two are seamlessly inculcated. Also, the works are fairly large, which is very nice. And here's, uh, Sonia did a show sort of um, of that, uh, works from that shrine, including a painted backdrops and things. And you can see that it's larger than your normal small 19th century photo. So it's something that I really love and I'm very delighted that we could, um, we could acquire for the museum. Um, so I don't take photos, you know, they don't have to be the pure sepia kind of 19th century vision. And in fact, just to prove it to you, I'm gonna end with a couple of the vernacular works. At the Perry Photo Flea Market Fair, there's somebody who um, brings back a lot of, has a lot of photos that he acquired um, a number of years ago when he lived in India. And they're from probably the 60s, 70s. And they're these really kind of funky combinations of um, graphic images, mod designs, and, um, you know, and then portraits. So they have this wonderful sort of sense of the vernacular and you know they were done by commercial studios, but they really have this uh, wonderful sense of whimsy, but they also relate to architectural and sculptural motifs uh, in the architecture and we actually in the temples and they have meanings and we actually have some um, images of temples and some fragments from temples that relate to some of the circular images, although they've been sort of here it's been 1960s modified um, as, as in mod. And then the last image I'm gonna show you is this wonderful one. So I'm gonna leave you with a sense of an offering. Um, this is another image I got at that photo fair. And it's, these, it's a wedding portrait, probably. It's probably the bride and groom. And at a wedding you would offer you know, good wishes or, or presents to them. And here they're being offered on these wonderful hennet hands in this hand tinted photo with the blue. Um, and blue in Muslim um, iconography represents heaven, but given his uh, red mark, it's probably clear that he's a Hindu. So we're not quite sure why the blue, maybe it was just a personal preference. But um, so I've gone the range from those very traditional, beautiful 19th century landscape scenes and temples, all the way to sort of funky, uh, wonderful, quixotic images like this. And I intend to keep acquiring. So there you have it. Thank you, Barbara. That's fantastic. Um, I just want to remind everyone we're going to allow you to unmute yourselves to ask questions. Um, and Evan, I'll hand it off and to you. We do. We do have some questions in the chat uh, from the very specific to uh, to the more general, Barbara. Um, uh, we had an, a question early on from one of your first um, plates, Barbara, uh, to please explain uh, what is Skeen and Company. Well, there were, um, originally it was believed that there were two major companies in Ceylon. And Essa, you know much more about this than I do. So if I'm speaking wrong, speak up. But um, now scholarship has discovered a number more, um, including Raphael, who wrote a book on um, Ceylonese photography. But basically, um, there were two companies that sort of controlled that most of the photographs seemed to come from that in Ceylon. And, and so Skeen was one of those. So it was a, it was a professional studio. Yes, a professional studio. Okay. Um, the next question was, uh, do you think the condition issues that are all related to heat, lack of air conditioning, et cetera, for uh, just because they, they were in India in this kind of harsh, uh, harsh climate? Um, yeah, definitely. Yes. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Also, um, it, a lot of the... Um, it was hard making photographs there because of the conditions, because of the humidity, the heat, the response of the chemicals. And so, you know, there tend to be, um, you know, one may, might think that there might be more poorly developed or poorly produced images 
there than there might be in the equivalent period in England, say. But also a lot of these uh, books and, and um, were, these photographs were put into albums like books and they sat on um, shelves and probably in not very well heated English houses. So it's, it's hard to totally assign blame because a lot of them came to England fairly early on in their history, supposedly. Um, well, they must have they must have been on ships too, which would not necessarily have been heat, but certainly tough conditions. Yeah, and the the if you do have discoloration fading, it tends to come in from the edges, especially on three edges, where you know if the album was bound, it might have been tighter on the spine. And so it would creep in on those. You, you commonly see that a little bit on each of the three three of the sides, three of the four sides. Uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. We have a question. Where was the original expertise from? How did, how did native Indian, you know, Indian born people learn how to learn the technology? Well, photography came to India fairly quickly, um, but it came from colonials who, um, you know, must have had uh, hired local people to work as their assistants and eventually entrusted more and more duties to them so that um, they, you know, a lot of the photos that came from studios, we don't really know, you know, it may say Skeeton Company, but there may have, might have been a very um, ambitious Ceylonese man who worked for Skeen and who ended up taking pictures. You know, we don't, the authorship of these is in many cases, um, you know, it's, it's almost a kind of corporate authorship because there were certainly studio assistants who were helping and we don't know how great their role was. Right, right. Um, uh, who else do we have here? We have, um, um, there was a question, um, what other museums have, have collections like this? Who, uh, you mentioned Raphael, um, but, uh, um, are there particular people that you say, uh-oh, there's so-and-so, they're competing for the same stuff we are? Well, we're certainly not the biggest, you know, or the best collection by any means. Um, but yeah, the Getty Research Institute has a fabulous collection. And I'm sure places like the Met and other places have, you know, have great holdings too. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, SF, you can think of someplace else, you know, speak up. Um, in America, but I'm um, not the largest holding. One of the real finds, and Barbara, you have to go visit, is uh, the Dean Dale collection at the Peabody Essex Museum. Oh, I, I, right? I well, <laughs> except, except they're, yeah, they don't have as many as they thought. They yeah, actually it has just, a long sorted history. But in terms of Dean Dayal, it's such a wonderful um, collection because it did come from the studio. Um, and the other thing I was going to note is, you know, when you talk about Dean Dayal, you also have to think about um, his role. He was the royal photographer of the Nizam of Hyderabad, who was the wealthiest Indian ruler in the Indian subcontinent. And he was like his court photographer. So when you see the access he had to the family portraits or to the uh, fancy uh, parties in Simla, it was because he was actually chronicling all of the acts of the kingdom. And, you know, the military acts, the, the famine acts. So that's, I think it also gives him kind of a position of uh, who's behind the camera and why he's photographing. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And much like Beato, which you bring up, um, you know, that, that uh, image, very famous image of all the corpses, you know, it's long believed that he, he actually arranged those corpage, corp for propaganda because the people, like you said, were the British who were buying it, right? So right. it's interesting to see like what perspective they have. Um, and the other thing that no one, as far as I know, has really studied is the amateur photography uh, clubs in India. They're called the APAs. And they started, as you said, like very early. And I'm so curious. Um, and that's in private collections. And then the Indian Office Library has probably the largest collection of the world of 19th century photographs oh, from India London. because because that's where everything was sent. Everything was documents and those documents were sent back to England. 
And a lot of the British Museum has a lot of its collection online, which is really helpful. The Royal Ontario Museum also has a good collection um, because of Dipali Dewan. And um, we actually got, a, it, um, Dean Dial's sons carried on the business. And we actually got as a gift from Naomi Rosenblum and her family, um, one of the uh, later famine albums that he did for the Nizam. So it's not um, in great shape. So we put it in the library instead of the collection because it just, it, there are parts of it that just couldn't be restored to sort of, you know, I can show parts of it and still borrow it. But so, yeah, no, there's, and, and of course the, in, if you can get to India, the Alkazi collection, which Essa helped start and, and really um, organize is just a fabulous, fabulous resource, which I hope to see someday. On a, on a little uh, self-aggrandizing Note, it, it gives me pleasure to see how many people are here who have been past PGH Photo Speaker Series speakers. Uh, um, Essa One, of course, and Peter Mostardo from The Better Image, and, and Lynn Benedict Jones, of course, former curator of the Carnegie Museum. I, you know, um, it is, uh, I think that a lot of people who are not um, in the middle of this world or whatever kind of world that is full of experts um, can be intimidated and can feel excluded and can feel um, that it's just this, this, uh, this special members only kind of environment that, that they're not welcome into. Um, when in fact, I know for myself that people like Peter and Essa and Barbara and Linda you just ask them a question, you will get answers like the community that we're experiencing here today with, with, with a Zoom like this. And so I encourage any of you who are not, who do not happen to be the curator of fabulous private collections or major museums to, um, to you know, come anytime you meet these people in person, please ask them your questions because they welcome them and answer them beautifully. Um, uh, we have another question uh, in the Krishna Shrine image collage. What do you make of that fluorescent pink tiled ceiling? Well, I, I actually, that shrine, the, the Krishna sculpture gets dressed up for different occasions. He's a child and he likes to play and he likes luxurious things. And he actually keeps a schedule and his clothes are changed for different activities and for different seasons. And so, um, it's really quite amazing. So I think that was probably the decorations. We've been trying to track down, we think, I'm trying to remember, I think we did actually come close to tracking down which festival he is adorned for. And those colors might be part of that festival uh, that relates to that part of the season or that festival. Um, so there may very well be a special symbolism or that may be in fact the way the, the shrine is adorned at that particular time of year. And those are the clothes he would wear for a particular event. We think it might have to do with the festival um, with the cattle because of the cattle imagery. Unlike the blue, not a symbolic color? Um, a symbolic color, but in relationship to the festival and the moment. So it's really a the way he's dressed, the decorations on the wall, the fabric hangings behind, around him, all of that is kind of a temporal clue that leads you to a season. And it might be a season or a festival that has something to do with either the time that those two worshipers went, or if they like that season better than the time they could actually go, they could commission, you know, and, and it's still a question as to how, I mean, it's amazing to me that the scale of the heads is perfect. And yet, because there was a time frame, if you wanted to get this painting done before you left and you weren't there for very long, uh, it was a kind of a workshop mass production kind of um, uh, enterprise. And so things had to be done ahead of time in order so that things could really be finished. So you could take them with you when you left the shrine. And um, so it's really quite an amazing enterprise, but you could probably order a different season if that suited you better. Got it. Um, I'm going to kind of combine a couple here. Um, perhaps this is trade secret, but uh, you're you're asked who are you looking for next, and uh, and also um, are you finding more 20th century images than than you thought perhaps you would 
you would find, uh, you know, originally that you thought you might find? Um, well, you know, it's, I sort of, photography may be a sort of a finite universe, but it's a very large universe. And so as one dips into specializing and collecting, especially at the museum level, in all these different areas, you need to build up a certain amount of expertise. And as you said, you know, ask other people for help because people are very welcome, uh, welcoming and very helpful. So I've gone into the 19th century world and been collecting in that. Um, uh, I have, I really want to get some of the Dean Dial buildings because that's really what he was best known for. So I want to get some of the architectural photos to complement um, the ones that we have of, we have so many wonderful ones of people. But in terms of contemporary people, we've talked with some contemporary Indian photographers about doing projects at the museum that would be related to aspects of our Indian art collection perhaps or build off of it. Um, nothing's really come to fruition yet but I haven't gone out to sort of wholesalely buy 20th century Indian photographies. Um, you know, I've seen some shows and surveys and things like that, but again, I need to see what's out there because I don't have unlimited funds. I can't buy everything. And so I need to kind of understand what the range is and then perhaps delve into it. Also, there's not as much of an opportunity for it to be shown in that Sony is happy to have 19th century examples that work with our traditional art collection or even 20th century ones, but they need to relate to the traditional art. And much Indian photography relates to contemporary life as we live it now. So um, those are all factors in, um, and I haven't really made the, um, the jump into buying 21st century Indian photography. Um, uh, in a kind of related way, uh, we know of your ongoing and past uh, interest in, in, in women photographers uh, and, and your participation in that seminal book, uh, Women Photographers. Um, what has been the contribution you found of, of female photographers, either 19th century to the present? Well, I haven't found any 19th century photographs that I know to be by women. Um, that would be really great, Indian women photographers. Um, I... I think there might have been one or two wealthy women who did it. And as I was talking about the amateurs before, maybe in the late 19th or early 20th century, but um, I haven't found any of that yet. Now there are a number of contemporary Indian women photographers who are quite strong and very interesting. And so I hope one of these days we'll be, we'll be venturing into that area. And Essa shows a lot of them, which she had a gallery is to love to go there and hoping that once again, at some point, you know, be a place to go and see this work. And uh, we were pleased in Pittsburgh to have Dianita Singh as part of the last international. Well, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, super. Um, well, at the risk of people being tired of my voice. Oh, and, and if I just have a little personal aside here, um, if you're confused, my name is not Sybil Streeter. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm, I'm working on my, my girlfriend, my partner's uh, um, computer and we're logged into her Zoom. So it's showing, it's showing her name, but I, I, I have not had a crisis of gender. It's still Evan Mirapol. Um, There's one more question that I do want to answer that I just see here because I can now see yeah. the chat. Um, um, Peter Mastardo was asking if there, well, maybe two questions. Are there any large format wax paper negatives from John Murray in the collection? Um, and are there even any available? Um, uh, yes, we do have one. We have one of the guest house of the Taj and it's so, sort of a scene from the back of the guest house of the Taj and we have the negative and the positive. So they're marvelous. They were bought by my predecessor, Tom Hinson. And um, while I would like to buy, there are a few around the market that I've seen. Um, the prices are high and I guess I would rather, since we have one of those pairings, I would rather buy something else that we don't have. Um, so, but there are some available. Um, if you're really looking for one, contact me privately and I can tell you some people who have them, whether they're for sale or not, I don't know. Well, some of them I know they're for sale, they're dealers. Yeah. Um, who else would like to ask a question not in chat? Any? Anybody like to chime in? Unmute yourself and participate perhaps, if you would like. I have a question. Am I 
Am I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Ben, I'm, you are. Okay, cool. Hey, Barbara, how are you? Hey, Ben, great to see you. You too. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't put this in the chat because I wasn't sure if I, if I heard this correctly. With the first seven or eight photographs you purchased, um, at, at, at like the side the side party during during the fair were a few of those by unknown photographers you said yes I'm now sure. they I'm may sure. be possible to identify them at some point but i haven't identified them yet yeah I'm, I'm i'm curious as a curator and this this might go just beyond collecting indian photography but what are what are the um what is like the museum perspective of collecting you know starting a collection with with um you know, work that you don't know who made it. I mean, it sounds like a roll of the dice, but it also sounds really exciting at, at the same time. I'm curious, um, did the museum have any any um, feedback on that? Or is that is that a common, um, you know, practice in museums for acquiring work? I'm, I'm just, I think that's really exciting as someone that buys work on eBay by people who they don't know <laughs> for their walls. I, you know, I, I like, it, it's good to know museums are doing it too. Could you talk more about it? Sure. Well, first of all, the Cleveland Museum is such a wonderful comprehensive museum, but that means because we cover the history of art in globally, there are many, many of our collections that have no names, no artist names attributed to them. Um, you know, many of our collection, well, a lot of the Indian art, the sculpture doesn't have names attached to it. The um, pre-Columbian art, um, some, a lot of the um, uh, ancient classical art, um, so that's not so unusual for us, you know, at modern and contemporary art museums, it might be a bit of a kerfuffle, but it's not a problem at the Cleveland Museum. Um, also, um, you know, it, it's a little different because it's a 19th century work and, you know, photography wasn't valued in the same way. It certainly wasn't considered art and that, that mark of authorship wasn't so important in many cases. Um, and I know this happened in Hong Kong. I don't know how much it happened in India, but in Hong Kong, um, dealers, uh, photographers would sell their negatives to other photographers and those other photographers would print them with their own names on them. And that was quite common and it was not regarded as stealing. So the attitude towards that in the 19th century was very different. Now, if I were to buy a 21st century work and say, well, I don't know who made it, you know, I might get a little flack. Got it, got it. It'll, it would be interesting to see, like, I mean, do you, is, is that something you, you are, you, you know, that you, you'd like to do is track down or find out who made the, who these unknown artists are, if, uh, or, or the unknown authors of those first? Of course, things. I'm an art historian. I want all those details. I, I do too. Teacher I, made you memorize. <laughs> I do too. I think that's really, really interesting and, and, and an interesting first step for beginning a, a collection too. But, you know, you can look for, I mean, I really judge on the work. You know, is it a good image? Is it a, a, a good, good print? Is it a strong image? Does it, you know, when you look at it, does it take you somewhere? And, you know, the other thing is context. Museum curators don't just buy what they like. They want something that has a context in the collection so that it will be shown with something. Because if you, if you have one work that stands out and it's different from everything else, you're not likely to show it. You need to have other things to put it on the wall with so that it makes a story, so that it makes an exhibition. And so consequently, um, you know, you're looking for things that fit in with other objects in your collection that illuminate them, that talk to them, that set a context for them. And so, you know, whether it has a name on it or not, um, if the subject matter works with other works in our collection and helps illuminate, for instance, Indian sculptures, fragments from temples, uh, facades or things or sculptures, then, you know, then it's really got a place in our collection. Thank you so much. Um, Linda Benedict Jones has an interesting question dash comment that is, is really quite intriguing. She she asks, does, uh, does Cleveland have a large Indian community? She says in Pittsburgh, for example, we have a whole cricket league. And she surmises that I'll bet you could find family albums from India right here in closets. So I wonder whether you've explored, you know, some sort of Indian diaspora, um, you know, somewhere in the US and tried to find like what sort of vernacular pictures are just still in the possession of families. Well, I'm still a little cautious about the vernacular pictures, 
Um, <laughs> they're a little far out for us. But you know, in terms of 19th century work, it's unlikely that those things would have been in Indian family albums. And Essa, maybe you think I'm, you know, maybe you have a different viewpoint. But from what I've I've heard from people, I mean, most of those things were not bought by other Indians. They were bought by the colonial or meant for an export market. Um, so, but I would certainly be open to trying. Um, you know, curators are scavengers at heart and we love to, to dig and hunt and we love the, the, the thrill of the chase. So that's a great idea. Any last thoughts or any other questions that I've missed, Barbara, that you see in the list? Let's see. Um, with, my, with my bad eyes. Well, somebody asked about the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. They do have some works. I don't know how many. Um, and let's see. Mari has a question. Mari, yes. do you want to jump in? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbara um, and everyone. I wanted to ask about um, perhaps changes to the market since PhotoFest 2018, because you know, PhotoFest 2018 was all about India, and I think Sunil Gupta was the, the curator. Yeah, was. And I was wondering whether that event in 2018 perhaps changed the market that you've been talking to us about, or maybe even increased the interest in, in Indian photography um, stateside. I think it, that was, um, to my memory, and I was there and I did try to see everything, that was mostly contemporary work. I think they had a few vintage works up at the MFA, but um, so I would hope that it helped increase the interest in contemporary Indian photography, um, but I'm not sure if it really did. Um, most of the people that I, curators that I know who were there who are doing shows of Indian work already have a specialty in Indian. They've already been there, they know, you know, the Indian photographers and have been thinking about working with them. So, but I would hope it would but it was mostly contemporary, it wasn't 19th century. Excellent. Well, um, I will, it's nearly six. And so in the interest of keeping things tidy on a, on a lovely summer evening, um, maybe it's a good point to wrap up. Um, Barbara, thank you so much. This was everything that I had hoped for and- yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's such a treat to have a spotlight shown on um, uh, an area of, of photography that really so few of us uh, even know exists, much less have delved into as deeply. And, uh, and, and so we, we thank you for that. And I wanna thank everybody for coming. Such a great turnout and so many old friends and hopefully some new friends. Um, and also, you know, realize that I'm showing you warts and all, this was my, sort of stumbling into a new area and trying to get my feet wet and become more acquainted with it. And it's something that you all can do too. Not that I want more competition exactly. out there, but um, Hong or Kong- find a different, uh, uh, Or find a different corner. Yep, there's plenty of corners out there still. So I encourage everybody to, everybody here obviously has an interest in photography and collecting. Fabulous, Casey? Yeah, I think that's a great place to wrap. So yeah, thank you everyone. Um, please do uh, stay tuned for our next um, event. Uh, we've got David Cron and a uh, conversation with Tristan Lund and, um, and then we'll have a, a third sp speaker series and a, a surprise event, a, a to be announced event later on. So um, stay tuned for the rest of our virtual season. Uh, everything's on our website uh, and we look forward to seeing you down the road. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.